This program contains true stories of rescues. All of the 911 calls you will hear are real. Whenever possible, the actual people involved have helped us reconstruct the events as they happened. Cape Elizabeth, Maine, on the morning of November 27th, 1989, at the home of 16-year-old Sarah Michael. I remember Katie coming over to my house. It was the day after Thanksgiving, and we were going to go Christmas shopping. Disgusting. They're really good. My mother had baked cookies the day before, and we decided to have one because she loves chocolate chips. What do you think it was? She took two bites out of her cookie and immediately asked me, what are in these cookies? And I said, just normal type things. The two girls had planned to spend the afternoon shopping with friends at a mall in South Portland, six miles away. Hey. I was in a pretty good mood. I think we all were. <laughs> Lori pulled out and started driving to Portland. Did you have a good Thanksgiving work? Yeah, I did. Went to Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. Today, I think. Turkey dinner, aunt's house. Monty's. Did you drive it in your car or did you go with parents? No, we all just took a car. Oh, one car? Katie had asked to go to the drugstore to get some asthma medicine, and she went in and bought some allergy pills. I have asthma too, so I noticed her wheezing, and she definitely wasn't as talkative or chatty as she usually is. Katie's friend Lori was driving that day. Katie was on the window, probably about halfway there, and just we just said she wanted some air, and then she started putting her hand up towards her mouth. I just figured that. She just maybe had the flu or something, nothing major. And right before we were about to go off the ramp, she started to throw up. Oh, okay, okay. Let's go home. Yeah. Here, Katie, here's a taxi. That's when we decided to go left to home rather than right, which is the mall. And I asked her, you know, are you okay? And she said, yes, but I, I am wheezing. And I think it was something in the cookie. We were all pretty quiet. We were just kind of like trying to, I guess, reassure her that she would be okay. She was just sitting up real straight, and she was having a really hard time breathing, and she was kind of holding her throat a little bit and said, I'm not going to make it. Take me to the police station. We became panicked when she said that. We knew that the Southport Police Station was in a general area, but we didn't know which street to get to it. She said that she felt like her throat was closing up, that she couldn't breathe. I was very worried. I was very scared. Something was different. This wasn't a normal asthma attack. Katie, can I see your hand? I looked at Katie's nails and they were blue. I was looking in the mirror. They were giving me signs that they were scared, but we were trying to you know, keep it pretty calm between us because we didn't want Katie to get scared. I've never been to that police station. I knew it was one of two roads, and I just happened to pick the wrong one. We turned down this long street, and when we got to the end, we were facing a one-way street going the opposite direction, and the police station really was only about two to 300 yards away from us. I'm going up it, guys. I said, I'm going up it, and Katie said, no, turn around, go up the other way. I knew she didn't have much more than a few minutes, so I just wheeled the car right around and just lowered it. 
that was probably the scariest part because right then she was just, I mean, couldn't breathe, couldn't do anything. And I knew that I just had to get that car going as fast as I could. And we were all thinking that she was just going to pass out on us and die. When we continue. I started crying because she was my best friend. And she's so young. She's got so much more to do, so much more to see. And she hasn't done enough and hasn't lived enough. Stay strong, Kate. When 16-year-old Katie Martin seemed to be suffering a severe asthma attack, her friends rushed to get her to the nearest police station before she could no longer breathe at all. We were all kind of planning out what we were going to do when we got to the police station. And I decided that I'd be the one to call Mrs. Martin, and Sarah would be the one to go run and get the police. Allison and I were basically out of the car before it had stopped. Sarah quickly explained the problem to the first officer she met. Right out there, in the parking lot? Yes, yes. Okay, go ahead, I'll call you. She was just frozen and just kept saying, help me, Laurie, help me, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. She just looked up. She just looked so scared and so helpless. What happened to her? Officer Buddy Pelletier was first on the scene. What's your name? Katie. Katie, listen to me. People that have respiratory problems, the more they gasp for air, the less oxygen they get. Her respirations were getting shallower and shallower, and at some point in time, she actually stopped breathing. She just looked up into my face and then the policeman's face, and I couldn't help her. And I couldn't do anything for her, and I couldn't stop what was happening. Detective Peter McVean also ran to help. Just as he got around the corner, her body just gave away. A South Portland ambulance was dispatched from less than two blocks away. I started crying because she was my best friend, and she's so young. She's got so much more to do, so much more to see, and she hasn't done enough and hasn't lived enough. EMT Kevin Giemund arrived within minutes. I knew right then when we were pulling in that she wasn't breathing. She just looked like a sack of potatoes. Okay. He took the respirator out of the kit. I immediately put it on her face and started forcing air into her lungs. She wasn't getting the air that way. You can see the air coming on the sides. Her throat was just swollen up and closed up, apparently. You can tell if they're dying or not. If they're chalky, if they're... You can tell. This girl was on her way out. I could have wasted time, try to start an IV, try to do some other things, but that wouldn't have saved her. She needed air. She needed oxygen. Without oxygen, Katie could suffer permanent brain damage within six minutes. I took an oral airway there, about three inches long. Usually you can pop an oral airway in and ventilate fairly decently, but it just wouldn't work. She had a lock jar. Her teeth were locked together. So I grabbed a nasal airway. It's a skill you learn in basic DMT class, that, but you learn it one evening for ten minutes and that's it. You never really think you're going to use it. Try that. It worked real quick. Real quick. All right, give me a drive. Let's get out of here. At that time, I still wasn't positive she was going to live. We just all said we got to think positive. You know, they're professionals. They can bring her back. Katie was admitted to the main medical center under the care of Dr. Rick Baker. She wasn't moving any extremities and was really very unresponsive on arrival. We were very concerned that she was going to continue to deteriorate to a full arrest. As soon as Katie's mother Sally got Allison's call from the police station, she headed to the hospital. I thought the girls had just maybe overreacted. Katie has had allergies and asthma really ever since she was a tiny baby. I remember walking through the door and I said to her, where's Katie? And the nurse looked at me and she said, um, Katie is in the trauma unit and we're working on her and we're doing the best we can. At that point, I felt like somebody taking a sledgehammer and knocked me right in the stomach. 
Our concern was to give her an injection of adrenaline just the moment she hit the place. 0.5 of epi? It stops the swelling that's going on and really puts a halt to the allergic response. Okay, okay, Katie. Sorry, Katie. Okay, Katie. Okay. She took an additional two injections of adrenaline in order to help stabilize her. And on top of that, required some Benadryl, which is an antihistamine, to help pull her out of this. It probably took about 20 minutes for her to wake up and sit up and talk to us. I went over to her side and I took a hold of her hand, which was ice Hi, cold, Katie. and she Hi, darling. She looked at me. No, Katie, it's Mom. The only thing I could think of was that she was an angel, because I, I had thought I was dead. You were fine. In the emergency room. And I said, fine. in this mother-teacher tone, I said, Katie, it's your mother. You're fine. You're going to be all right now. Katie survived without any permanent injuries. Her parents later questioned her friends to discover what had caused the near-fatal allergic reaction. Mr. Martin said, did she eat any nuts? And that's when I said, yeah, there were nuts in the cookies. There were walnuts in the cookies. And he said, that's what it was. It never occurred to me that an allergy could be that bad. I think all of us have just kind of learned to appreciate life a little more. It made us stronger, I guess, as friends. Katie has since been tested for other allergies. She now wears a medic alert tag that lists them and a number to call in an emergency. Although more than a year has passed, her father Al can't forget. It's only later that it really hits you, I think. I'm really a lucky guy. I mean, I came so close to losing a daughter and uh, just by a combination of her own good sense and three wonderful young friends that were mature enough to know what to do and then finally the rescue people that did such a professional talented job they are the difference between Katie being here and her not being here when you've been that near death you know I think it really makes you aware of how thin the line is you know you only live once or most people do and you gotta live life to what it is. If you wanna do something, you do it. And you don't wait for it to happen to you. You go out and do it.